Thorstein Veblen was a pioneer in the field of heterodox economics for his scathing and insightful criticisms of capitalist society, especially in terms of how its ideological and cultural facets contribute to an absurd approach to production and to social relations more broadly. Many of his works were published during the Progressive Era in the United States, and perhaps his best-known book is The Theory of the Leisure Class, which was published in 1899. In that book, he outlines his understandings of the anthropological origins of private property and the concepts that he believes perpetuates its existence, such as force, violence, and ruthless predatory behavior that continue on into the present era under capitalism. Like Karl Marx, Veblen believed that capitalism was premised on an unjust exploitation of workers. However, Veblen's unique contribution to economics is the particularly nuanced ways in which he describes the ideological concepts that are constructed in order to explain and justify the existence of class-based hierarchies. So therefore, we might say that Veblen had a much more developed concept of the superstructure and the role of ideology in capitalist society than Marx did. So influential was Veblen's thinking that his works spurred the emergence of a school of thought in heterodox economics called institutional economics, which focuses on the ways that social customs and ideologies shape the economic preferences and values of individuals and determine how our economy is structured more broadly, especially in terms of classes. Veblen argued that of utmost importance to the concept of class is not just the concentration of material wealth, but also the acquisition of some spurious, socially constructed concept of honor or esteem that stems from a thorough repudiation and even disgust with all types of useful and productive labor. The result is a society that glorifies waste, frivolousness, and predation, while rejecting things or people that ought to be valued for their useful contributions to social welfare. And while the forms in which such an ideology might manifest itself can change from society to society as economic systems develop and employments become further nuanced and distinguished, Veblen believed that this same basic kernel of the glorification of violence and waste remains a powerful tenet around which modern-day capitalist societies were organized. To comprehensively understand Veblen's analysis of economic institutions, including in those in capitalist society, we have to start with his evaluation of pre-capitalist surplus-producing societies. Surplus-producing societies are societies that have developed to a point in which economic production more than satisfies the basic material needs that people have to survive, implying that there are economic resources that can be used to sustain non-essential activities and wealth accumulation. Typically, anthropologists argue that surplus producing societies were made possible thanks to the advent of agriculture roughly 10,000 years ago, which exponentially increased food yields and made it possible for only a fraction of people in a given society to focus on the production of material sustenance. Veblen draws on the anthropological insight that with the rise of surplus producing societies, we begin to see the bifurcation of people into two major groups or classes. Um, those who perform manual labor to produce the material needs of society and those who don't. At the bottom of social hierarchies, we find this former group, people like farmers, slaves, artisans, and especially in early societies, <clears throat> women, since they either tended to be owned by men outright or oftentimes formed the productive backbone of tribal life. Um, conversely, at the top of the hierarchy, we might find you know, those in the upper classes who don't produce anything materially useful for society, but instead live off of the surplus produced by those who did. So this might include positions like war, chieftain, politics, bureaucrats, sports, academia, and religion. 
This is not to say that people in the upper tiers didn't exert any effort as part of their profession. They obviously did. But oftentimes their work was ceremonial in nature, executed primarily for show or for custom, and not for some useful outcome. So Veblen distinguished labor as something that directly contributed to the production of material wealth. And clearly those in the upper tiers did not do that. Um, this, coupled with later iterations in the ruling class in capitalist society that we'll discuss later, is why Veblen designates these two classes as the working class and the leisure class. In his well-known book, The Theory of the Leisure Class, Veblen begins by tracing the anthropological origins of private property and the social themes that arise coterminously with it in order to justify its existence. The advent of private property ushers in a predatory and combative approach to social relations in which individuals begin to compete to establish their importance and superiority over others. This competition is primarily waged through violence and the ostentatious display of goods forcefully appropriated from others. So killing, stealing, and fighting become the primary vehicles to establish a human being's worth or honor with social esteem being accorded based on the varying abilities of individuals to acquire property and wealth by forcibly usurping it from others. At the same time, the work performed by the bottom echelons of society, useful, productive manual labor, was derided as a marker of low social status by the ruling class and by the prevailing ideologies of society at large. In order to demonstrate one's capacity to use force against others, tangible or physical evidence was of paramount importance. So it was not enough to successfully complete an act of aggression against others, but physical evidence of such an aggression must also readily be furnished. For this reason, seizing spoils or trophies from war and even the seizing of female captives came to be lauded as one's ability to kill or otherwise eliminate competitors and helped make the distinction between the possessor and the supposedly weaker enemy from whom they were taken. For example, the practice of troops um, looting cities that they successfully invaded is a well-recorded practice in history. And as another example, anthropologists tell us that the practice of taking and displaying body parts from vanquished enemies is a cross-cultural and ubiquitous phenomenon. So the glorification of violence and theft results in a veneration of destruction and gore on a macro level. The result is a society in which status is premised not on the usefulness of the work that one does or how they contribute to the well-being of others, but rather on the use of savagery and brutality to acquire wealth as a type of spectacle for social esteem. Venerating the use of force and violence as means to acquire goods resulted in the simultaneous devaluation of productive labor. This is not because, as mainstream economists might argue, work is inherently unpleasurable, but rather because the ability to steal or exploit was held in the popular imagination to be the product of power, intelligence, and superiority. As a result, those who led a relatively peaceful and productive lifestyle were assumed to embody personal defects that prevented them from rising to a level of wealth made possible by conquest. Writing in his article, The Instinct of Workmanship and the Irksomeness of Labor, Veblen argues, quote, the tame employment, those that involve no obvious destruction of life and no spectacular coercion of refractory antagonists fall into disrepute and are relegated to those members of the community who are defective in predatory capacity. That is to say, those who are lacking in massiveness, agility, or ferocity. Occupation in those employments argues that the person so occupied falls short of that decent modicum of prowess which would entitle him to be graded as a man in good standing. So for Veblen, the origins of private property are not, as mainstream economists might argue, the desire to be productive or industrious or to serve one's own self-interest, but rather are surrounded in force and violence and a parasitic usurping of wealth from the lower classes. 
And what makes Veblen interesting is that he actually traces much of those themes in early society relating to force and violence and private property into the contemporary capitalist era, arguing that those same desires or impetuses exist in capitalist society, but only now they take the form of more modern or civilized behaviors.